Laura Lokers is a licensed master social worker and she has extensive research in treating hoarding behavior. This video identifies and defines hoarding disorder, explains successful treatments, and she also discusses the challenges of treatment. Recent estimates are anywhere between 1 in 50 to 1 in 20 Americans meet criteria for hoarding disorder. Hoarding disorder is new. It's not a new behavior, it's a new diagnosis. These agencies are the ones stumbling upon this problem, not me, right? I may be treating it, but I'm not the one finding it. So the idea is pooling our resources to try and work with these people in a community to actually make some headway on the problem rather than having this merry-go-round of ineffective treatment. So the three main characteristics of hoarding disorder, the top two are really obvious, right? It's acquiring too many things and having difficulty getting rid of things. And the third component is really about these organizational difficulties, okay? The two parts of the brain that were really overactivated in folks with hoarding disorder, the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula. Now, what do these two parts of the brain do? One involves decision making, okay? The other part of the brain involves spatial awareness our ability to interact with things and accurately process that information. The, the, one of the challenges I have with them is there's very often, and I understand this is part of TV and editing, they will very often present these cases tied up in these bows where you're like, this person was going along and they were fine and then this trauma happened and all of a sudden the hoarding problem developed. I, I gotta say, I don't agree. I think that trauma, like every other mental health condition, doesn't increase the chances of developing or exacerbating pre-existing health conditions. Absolutely. But does it cause hoarding? No way. I have no evidence of that. So the problem is, is that other people manage your stuff when you're younger, so you may not realize that this is a problem. Then what happens when we're younger, we move around a lot more. The older we get, the more stationary we become, we become, the more fixed we become. The more fixed you become, the more stuff accumulates. They often believe that they are going to be able to get it under control. Uh, you've probably heard this from clients who say, well, once I get the house cleaned up, once I get everything taken care of, once I get my stuff in order, um, they, they believe it's going to happen. It's not a... It's not like they are resigned to say, wow, my house is always going to be this bad for the rest of my life, and I'm okay with that. So what's the difference? I think there are a couple of key things. One is when we keep clutter accumulates in most of our houses, it's really without thought. It's sort of accidental. You just all of a sudden look over and the kitchen counter is covered. With hoarding, it's very deliberate collecting. It's, it's bringing it in purposefully, looking for that specific item. It's not impairing your, your quality of life. Clutter, at the end of the day, is something that doesn't look attractive, but rarely impedes your ability to function. Uh, but 80% of people with hoarding show absolutely no other OCD symptoms. Uh, the way I describe it is I think that hoarding is probably more of like a distinct cousin from OCD than it is a direct relative. It is the treatment that we have found to be effective in the short term and the long term. And what it requires is slow discarding and teaching skills for how to deal with stuff. Minimum we're really seeing that's probably effective is somewhere between around six months. The goals of treatment are really clear. We're trying to reduce the amount of cluttered living space. We're trying to increase the safety. We are also trying to increase the appropriate use of space. We're also trying to discard unneeded possessions and reduce the amount that are coming in the house. Okay? If you don't reduce the amount coming in, it's, never, it's going to be a constant cycle. One of the first steps that I do immediately is I want to cut off as much paper flow as I can coming in the house. If the paper is not there, then you don't have to make the decisions. This it will reduce your uh, junk mail that comes into your house by about 80%. Okay? This is uh, 1885 opt out. This is a government agency. This goes through the credit bureau. Next list. This puts you on the you can't sell out my information. 
One of the first things I have people create is a, a mail station. And for any of you who don't have one of these, create one tonight. It can be a table with a trash can underneath. There, you got a mail station. Okay. Put it no more than about 50 feet from where your main entrance to the house is. The rule will be when you cross that threshold, you have got three minutes to take your mail from that day and sort through it and pick out what you're going to keep, what you need to follow up on, and what needs to be thrown away immediately. I also like donation, people to get on donation uh, lists like Purple Heart and those that come to your home. A lot of times what they'll do for efficiency of like gas is if they're coming out to pick up for someone else, they'll call people in the area who have been on their list before and say, hey, we're going to be in the area, do you have any stuff? And so I'll make a rule to say, well, if they ever call, we always say yes. Even if we have one sweater for them to pick up, we always say yes. How many of you have heard the seven year rule? Yeah, it's actually not even a seven year rule. <laughs> Um, there is, you need to keep your tax paperwork or anything you needed to submit for three years. The only reason you need to keep it for longer is if you withheld more than half of your income that year for any reason, then you need to keep it for six years. The IRS also has this thing called a $75 rule that saves you a lot of hassle. So the IRS basically says if you have a receipt like for your house that is worth less than $75, it's probably not needed. It's not worthwhile to keep it. I require my patients to bring something to my office that they're going to throw away every time they see me. In the beginning, I don't care if it's a candy wrapper. I just care that you are getting in the habit of every time I see Laura, oh, i got to find something to take in. Uh, because this is, again, about creating habits. Okay? I am trying to help their brain create a habit for how to manage stuff. If you got in the habit of throwing away 10 pieces of paper a day or putting away 10 pieces of clothing or dishes or whatever, you would probably be able to keep up with your home pretty easily. They feel like it's got to be huge. I've got to put away 50 things because they're perfectionists, right? It's great to do things all at once. The problem is, is I don't think we get those big blocks of time most of the time. They boxed some things up. They cleared out the spaces. So now, is it perfect? No. But it was the area the chairs were cleaned out, the area underneath the table was put in some boxes that you can't see on the side, and they had two places to sit in. We would like to give you a little bit more information about harm reduction strategies. First things first, you'll want to clear a path that's 36 inches wide from the front door all the way to the back door. Beware of items that can impact structural stability. Also make sure there are no items on the stove or in the oven. Make sure there are no items against a heat source like the radiator, furnace, water heater, or anything else that's hot. Make sure there are no items piled higher than three or four feet all the way around the home, and make sure there are no items in the bathtub. This prevents from sewer gas buildup. Now back to Laura. You've got to make these quick and important decisions. I tell my patients that making decisions for them is like walking across quicksand. If they make their decisions really slow, careful, cautious, by the time they come to a decision, they're up to here. And now they're completely stuck and they can't move. One of the things that's important to remember is Ohio. This Ohio protects us from churning, which is only handle it once. Once something is in your hot little hand, you want to make a decision about it. You don't want to put it off until later because it feels like it's going to be easier later, but it's always going to be hard. I try and give people questions of think how to make those decisions. You know, do I have one similar to this? You know, when is the last time I've used this thing? When is the next time I would use this? These are questions that all of your brains go through like that. Okay? You just don't consciously have to walk your brain through that decision-making process, but they do. And my general rule is, okay, before you buy anything, because I want people to set up what we call an exchange system, and this is the way I encourage you guys to think about your own homes. 
if I bring in a sweater, I need to be thinking about what is a sweater I'm willing to get rid of in my closet now. Uh, always ask the question, yes, this object may have value. Is it more important than your health? Is it more important than your safety? Is it more important than your house being secure? Because it doesn't, you're not saving the thing. Everything goes to the landfill eventually. Our, our patients, a lot of times they say, well, I'll get rid of it when there's no longer a use. But there's always another use for options. I have seen patients keep some things that I thought on the surface, like, oh, that is, there's no use for that. And they had a plan. Yeah. Um, and the reality is that some of the plans aren't bad plans. In their minds, this is short term. Even if it's been going on for years and years. And so this is part of the challenge. Is this behavior is not only enjoyable, but they believe they are helping tons of people. Now, mind you, the stuff is not actually leaving the house and helping anyone. But in their minds, it's going to. In their minds, they have decided it's going to help all these people. So why would I get rid of it? I have to get family members on board with going slow and steady and believing that slow and steady will actually win the race when they want to go faster, 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 faster. I have assigned them to just go sit at mom's house and read a book while she's working on her homework for me. Your presence is going to help her be more aware of her environment. The thing is, is you've got to sit there and not comment on how many things she gets rid of, what she chooses, what she doesn't. You don't get to give any of that input. You might go in and go, oh my god, you have got 300 sweaters. And they go, what are you talking about? There's like 50 at best. And their brain believes it. In conclusion, here's the few things to remember. No one has all the answers when it comes to treating hoarding disorder. Make sure to have love and compassion towards the person hoarding. Understand they don't choose to live this way. For more information on hoarding in Kalamazoo, visit kalamazoohoarding.org. This video was brought to you by Service Master of Kalamazoo, your local hoarding experts.